Very good. All right. So originally these programs were held at the museum with organic conversations throughout the presentation and at the end. So we're very pleased to be able to bring it to you all in your homes. We thank RP Oak Hill Building Company for their continued support and presenting sponsorship of Conversations in Science. It is the support of our sponsors, donors, and members that enable us to continue our mission and to serve our community. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ullman. Catherine J. Ullman, PhD, is an independent researcher with an avid interest in death, the dead, and death culture in medieval Europe and the modern US. For over 17 years, she has been a member of the Buffalo chapter of a living history group called the Society for Creative Anachronism. And you can find them online at sca.org. Org. Dr. Ullman's classes and seminars such as Bling Out Your Dead and Hangman, Headsman, and Other Fun Ways to Die provide cultural and contextual insight to the artifacts and texts used in historical recreation. recreation excuse me. Um, and with that, I will turn the presentation over to our speaker, Dr. Ullman. I'll put a couple more messages in the chat to encourage people to use that for questions and answers. Um, and with that, Dr. Ullman, the presentation is yours. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Gabrielle, and thank you to the museum for having me. I'm, I've been very excited about uh, being able to talk to a broader audience because as much as I love talking to the Society for Creative Anachronism folks, they've seen me speak on a number of topics. And in fact, I'll probably give some version of this to them when we're meeting in person again, or maybe even remotely. But let me go ahead and share my screen here. Get this going. And I see a lot of repeat names, but also some new ones. So welcome to anyone who this is your first conversation in science. Um, we will be sending out a link after the program so that you all can watch online the recording. So if you like this, we can share it for you. All right, so this is going to be our agenda. I'll do a little introduction both about myself and kind of give you a little bit of background because I want to set the stage for what we're going to talk about, which really is going to be more about what the Black Death is and what we know about it now, uh, geographical spread of the Black Death, medicine in the 14th century, and we'll discuss how it wound up being a turning point in history, how medicine ultimately moves forward as a result, and we'll do a little comparison. I, I, seen a lot of people refer to COVID-19 as the plague. I, I can't blame them. It, it feels that way very much, but we'll actually delve into some similarities and differences. And by all means, questions are, are absolutely encouraged. I'd love to hear what you folks are thinking. So, all right. So a little about me. Uh, I have a very eclectic background. I have a master's in forensics. I also have that PhD in philosophy. You've heard about some of my research interests and the, the SCA. I do have one publication in this realm that was published a few years ago where I talked a little bit about the two interments that Richard III had and I did a comparison and contrast and provided some interesting insights that I got from some folks who were actually there for that second interment. All right, so now let's let's delve into what the meat of what we're going to talk about here. So let's pretend for a minute you travel back in time to some place in Europe in the 1340s AD. Okay, so think about this for a minute. This is the situation you would be living in. We have this tripart society. It's not friendly to the peasantry. There's a feudal system, again, not pleasant to the peasantry or the serfs. It's even not particularly good to some of the upper class, depending on what part of the upper class you're with. With all of this, there is a severe population problem. There are more people than they know what to do with, and they just keep coming. It's amazing. 
Despite multiple crop failures and food shortages, this doesn't stop the population from growing, which of course in turn makes the problem significantly worse. The poor are really poor. It is, is absolutely extreme poverty situation. There have been famines, there have been floods. It's a mess. So you'd think, you know, can't get a whole lot worse. Um, then within a few years, it, it gets much worse. This terrible disease sweeps over the land and ultimately we'll see it kills off a significant portion of the population. And this disease has become known as the Black Death. So what is the Black Death? Well, the Black Death itself, as we'll see, is ultimately a bacterial infection. But let's talk about first this nomenclature. It's likely this mis mistranslation of the Latin phrase atramors. And it's really, the, the mistranslation is really the atra part. It means both terrible and black. So instead of this becoming black, instead of it becoming the terrible death, which was probably the original intent, it becomes the black death. But what's interesting is that this phrase is not used during this period of time. It's not till centuries later when this even rears its head. You, when you do read about this in period literature or in uh, anybody's, uh, you, you see this mentioned in wills and other documentation, you see more often the words pestis, pestilina, which refers to epidemic. And we see references to this Latin plaga as early as 1349. So what is it? Well, it's, it's the second pandemic. There have been three major pandemics, not including this one in particular. The first one is 1541 to 740 AD. The second is the one we're going to talk about now. And the third one starts in 1894. What is it specifically? Yersinia pestis, it's a bacterial infection. We see it spread from Western Asia through the Middle East, North Africa, and Europe between 1346 and 1353. So how did this all come about? Blocked fleas. Ooh, we're going to talk about what, the, what that really means. There are a lot of people that know that fleas were involved, but not too many people who, know, who don't know about the details here understand that, that it wasn't just any flea. It had to be a blocked flea. And while people often blame the rats, really it was the death of the rats, black rat hosts, black rat hosts, that we see contribute to the problem. That coupled with malnourished humans, because as we saw, conditions were not good. All of those things are problematic. So that gives you just this very basic overview. So now let's go into some details. It's important to note that Yersinia pestis is, as I said, a bacterial infection. It's not a virus, which means it's not, so this bacteria is a living organism as opposed to a virus, which is not living. This is important because bacteria doesn't require a live host to reproduce, whereas with a virus, it does. We can see one is much larger than the other. And I purposely put as an example here, COVID is a virus and bubonic plague, which is in fact what Yersinia pestis is, that is bacteria. So just some details so we understand the differences here. So how did this all come about? Well, for a number of years, and we'll look at a map in a moment, there was something called a plague focus. And these are rodent populations where we see a continuous circulation and recirculation of this bacterial infection. So this still happens today. There's these foci exist today. Even there's even some in the United States out West. Black rats, are the rodents that are often found in human populations and they carry what are known as fur fleas. Fur fleas differ from their counterpart, which are nest fleas. Nest fleas are the type of fleas that are normally sitting on humans. They're not physically on the humans themselves. They live in their uh, clothing or bedding as opposed to traveling with the host with the human. So they don't adapt particularly well. And some research was done and that's sort of how they determine 
wasn't the nest fleas that were a problem, it was the fur fleas because they could adapt in this way. And what was also discovered is that fur fleas can survive in grain. So if you think about some of these long journeys, and, and when we look at the map, you'll get a better sense of this. There was question about how in the world did this travel so far and spread so fast? And some of it is that these fleas could live on ships in grain barrels, even when most of the humans died, it didn't matter because they still had a place where they could survive. All right, so why rats? Why were the rats important? Well, when plague was introduced into a house, you wound up with this, epi this rat episodic. You get enough rats dying, the fleas are gonna search for a new host. The problem is, as those rats die off, now there's more fleas on a single rat and they need ultimately more hosts. When the fleas run out of rats for hosts, they adapt and they go searching for something. And the something they find, human beings. So this is how the rats wind up in this circle. All right, so flea guts. Talked about the fact that it's only backed up fleas that are a problem. Well, these fleas not only have a stomach, but they have what's called a proventriculus, which is a valve. And if you look, I've given you two images, flea A and flea B. Flea A is your perfectly healthy flea. And flea B is one that is backed up. What happens is that a flea bites a human and it ingests blood. That's pretty standard. What happens over a while is that once they've done this enough and they've sucked in enough blood and enough bacteria, they get so engorged that this valve essentially gets stuck and they get blocked. So- Sorry, what, real, could, could you, is this like constipation kind of blockage? Yes, I mean, this is essentially, you know, it's like, it's, it's like a constipation except that, you know, your average flea isn't taking any emodium. So yep. they're stuck, right? And human fleas don't develop enough bacteria to be able to cause these blockages, which is why it's only this kind of flea that is problematic. So it's not gonna be your nest flea, your human flea, it's only gonna be these fur fleas. And because they're backed up, when they then go to do another bite, whether it's that human or another human, they regurgitate back into that wound. And ultimately, that's what causes the infection in the person that they're, or the other critter, because it obviously can be other critters. But in this case, we're talking about that, that, uh, that human cycle. So rather than try to just give you dates and dates and dates, I thought it might be interesting to look at this timeline because we talk a lot today about viruses and how long, long they last and uh, you know these different phases. So I thought it might be interesting to take a look at that sort of thing here. So this is how the Black Death works. So it starts out as this episodic, which is 12 days. And that's this idea that it's, it's among these rodents. So it's, it takes 12 days for it to kind of get into that colony of rodents. And then these rat fleas, it takes about three days for them to get to a point where the, the episodic has taken over the rats and they're dying off. And then those rat fleas are hungry. By the time they're, they're getting to the point where they're moving to their human host, from that point to the first infection transmission is gonna be about half to a day. And then within seven days, we wind up in this endemic phase. So the endemic phase, unlike an epidemic is like, think of, you hear of this case or that case. It's a handful, maybe a pocket, just a few cases here and there. So it's definitely within a population, but it's not, it's not um, all over the population. It's just here and there. So that goes on for about seven days. Then when then those cases, those endemic cases, the incubation and illness for that last endemic case, that's about eight more days. Then we wind up with the incubation and illness for the first epidemic cases, which is another eight days. So from the beginning of the episodic to the point where we now have an epidemic with humans is roughly 39 days, which is 5.6 weeks. 
So that's a pretty short timeline if you think about it's entering the rat population and going to humans. We're talking, you know, a little over a month. And that's part of why we see this move so quickly. Now, there are a number of different types of plague. Bubonic plague is your primary bubonic plague is your sort of typical plague. This is what most people have heard of. It starts with an infection in the lymphatic system. Really basic, it's most of the cases. You can see the, the image I've given you with the, you know, what are called the buboes down below. And this is what usually happens in, in that typical phase. That infective material goes along that lymphatic system. Usually you have about three to five days of incubation where you don't necessarily have any symptoms at all. And then the illness is three to five days during which you could recover. And apparently the magical day was day four. If you made it past day four, you might recover or you could just die. Um, but that, that's pretty pretty typical. So they say on the average, it was eight, eight days, right? Three to five for one and three to five for the other. Usually you wind up with fever, chills, headache, muscle pain, and buboes would develop, which is again, the sort of that picture you see in the, in the lower right hand corner. And that's a swelling. It could be a size of a pea, it could be an egg, and it could be in various lymph nodes. So while this image shows that it's in the armpit, which is very common, they also could be in the groin um, and a couple of other places, but that kind of gives you the basic idea. However, this was not the only form of plague. There was also something called bacteremic plague. And bacteremic plague ultimately is more serious because it goes directly into the bloodstream. So if they were to bite in certain areas such that it ultimately bypassed the lymph nodes, you're not gonna have buboes form. And no buboes forming, you might not know you were sick. Secondary bacteremic plague is when you, you have the injection, it does impact the lymph system, but it overwhelms that lymph system and it goes right in the bloodstream. And in those cases, it's almost always fatal. So, you know, that's, that's not ideal, right? Because those are the cases where they get sick in the morning and they're often dead by evening because it just completely overwhelms that system and there's nothing more anybody can do. There's also the pneumonic plague. And we'll see some interesting parallels about this later, but this is where somebody is infected and they're coughing and they pass it along to someone else. That's primary pneumatic plague. Secondary is when the bacteria from the bloodstream gets into the lungs and it causes them to, to spit up blood. This is almost always fatal. And usually these cases of secondary pneumonic plague are what cause people to have primary pneumonic plague because they're spitting up blood and their caregiver or somebody is nearby and that's how they catch it. Not fun stuff. So let's look at geographic spread. Ooh, right before yes. we go into geography, um, if you can back up one slide. You bet. What is the, is there a link between um, an individual that would display buboes and an individual that would have secondary pneumonic plague? Like, could you um, be one of the people that has bubonic plague, but is yes. not displaying buboes and then also have pneumonic plague? Yep, I mean, bad it's luck. certainly possible because it's really just about how it enters the bloodstream and whether or not it overwhelms the lymph system. So it certainly could overwhelm, it, it certainly could be the case that it enters bypasses the lymph node and gets into the lungs. And then you're talking, you know, that secondary pneumonic plague as well. So yeah, it, it just, in many cases, fatality was so fast, it kind of didn't matter. <laughs> you weren't going to live much longer. And, and it's very, to me, it was very interesting because a lot of these very variations on the plague, people didn't necessarily understand. They weren't sure if it was even the same disease and it wasn't until years later doing a lot of dna testing and things of that nature before they understood no these really are exactly the same thing um and that's really how we know that that makes a lot of sense thank you you're welcome anything else before we go on i'm ready for geography all right so let's go into the geographic spread 
and the origin. We already talked about the, the plague focus, right? So we have the rats, they're circulating this plague constantly in these areas. There are three we'll talk about that were the possible location for where it started. And I'll be honest, there's still some argument about this, but the most likely case is that it was the focus closest to the area where it was shipped to Europe. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that was this northwestern shores of the Caspian Sea uh, into southern Russia route. And so as a result, they think it was most likely it started in the steppe region, Kaffa in the Crimea. This is how, this, this is essentially the, the pattern of, of what we saw. So there were Italian merchants in 1346 that were at a permanent trading station in Kaffa. It was the last trading station that existed. And there was a Mongol attack at that point. When the Mongols attacked, the Italian merchants did what they could, but the plague broke out that fall and it not only was in with the attackers, but it spread to the town. So in the spring of 1347, those Italian merchants were like, we're out of here, we're done. We don't want any more of this and they flee. They arrive in Constantinople in 1347 and guess what they bring with them? Plague. As a result, the academic begins in 1347 in July. And now that you've seen kind of that timeline, it should hopefully make sense why you're seeing merchants arrive in May. By July, we see a full outbreak of plague. So spreading further, we see by September 1st of 47, it's in Alexandria. By mid-September, it reached its France. By November, it, you know, these Italian merchants that are still on their way back and maybe they're, they're going a different route and they go through Genoa or Venice by way of Pisa, they bring it with them there. We see France and Spain get hit by early 1348 and Oslo, Norway by 1348, a little later in the year. Now I could spend a lot of time on this timeline, but I don't think that's probably the most interesting part of this. So this just to give you a flavor of how quickly this was spreading and through various countries. So here's the map I kept making references to. And there were three main plague foci at the time. Uh, the first I mentioned before, it runs from the northwestern Kaza and Russian shores of the Caspian Sea. Here. All the way, yep, perfect. Uh, into southern Russia. The second runs from the eastern shore of the Caspian Sea, and it covers much of Central Asia. So Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and uh, Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan. So that's going to be your second one. And the third is uh, parts of the Russian Siberian border, areas on the Republic of Mongolia, most of Mongolia itself, and the northern parts of Outer Mongolia and Manchuria. So I know Gabrielle was going to talk a little bit about this geography because this is more her specialty than mine. So Gabrielle, I will, I will turn it to you momentarily to, to discuss that. Yes, so um, for these three foci, we're looking at the Caspian Sea, which is the farthest over on the right hand side of the screen. Um, the first kind of outbreak is in that green tone that you can see coming off the top northwest. Um, and then you can see the following year in 1347, it extends to the red, so extending both north and south. So coming down from the Caspian Sea, that is extending down into Iran. And uh, as it goes up, it's going through Russia and then kind of into the Ukraine, um, Russia in the purple, and then the Ukraine as you get into the tan color there. And that's really the first break that we're talking about. Um, it's also the simpler one to look at because there are fewer arrows <laughs> On the screen. <laughs> Absolutely. So that just kind of gives you a feel for, you know, these three areas, lots of plague, lots of rodents. And I believe that, you know, you're still going to find these pockets today. And like I said, they're even in the United States. So you can see how much spread we have from there. And again, I don't want to spend too much time on the details of, of each city and country that uh, it made its way into. There are many books, with lots of details, but I want to keep going and I want to talk about the reaction from the people who were there. 
I so just like to say um, before you move off of this, yeah. even going into the upper reaches of Norway, which is here shown in the tan color, um, looking at Oslo, it is um, only three years between the outbreak by the Caspian Sea and when you're having um, these really large results of individuals um, up into Norway. So yep. three years is not a long time, especially considering there's no air travel, there's no motorized transport. We're talking about yep. moving on foot and animals were not used for speed, but for transporting larger goods. So everything is traveling at human walking speed. Yep. Exactly. Or boats. But in that case, yes, all walking speed. All right. So reactions. Well, this should seem familiar. Life stops. There's no plowing. Shops are closed. You have no agriculture, ha you know, none of the typical agriculture things that we would see uh, beyond plowing. So no sowing of, of crops. None of that is happening. Churches stopped having services and offering last rites. People fled. They were terrified. They were so terrified that parents would leave their children. So child was sick and the parent found out that the kid was sick. Parent abandoned the kid. They were, they were done. They were out. They would leave their elderly. They found out that a, an elderly relative was sick and they'd run away from them too. They abandoned their property. They abandoned their houses. They were so afraid they just ran away. There were people who once they ran, they would maybe pick a place where they thought it was reasonably safe to gather because there'd been no episodes that they knew of. So they would gather together in those houses. They'd live in reasonable modesty um, and they would avo avoid as much as they could from the outside world. So they wouldn't bring in any luxuries. There were other people who took an extreme position where they thought, well, I'm gonna die anyway. So they would live with reckless abandon they would live in other people's houses. They would eat excessively. They would drink. There was general debauchery. It was crazy. And then there were people who took complete opposite and decided, well, I'm going to do what I have to do. I'm going to carry fragrant herbs, and we'll see why that matters in a minute. But I'm, I'm not going to hide the way the people in the, who gathered in the houses were. But I'm also not going to go crazy and, and drink and eat all the things. So this was your, your typical reaction to all of this. All right, so, you know, today we'd think, well, medicine, right? You, you go to the doctor, you're sick and you get some help. Let's look at what medicine looked like in the 14th century because it wasn't pretty. There were a number of roles in medicine. The first one were the physicians. These folks had university degrees but everything they did was theory based and the theories were from Greek and Roman times. None of it was current. So think about this. We're talking 1340s and they're still arguing points that were made in the first and second centuries. It's amazing. And this is what they did. They were literate. They were totally literate and they were elite. Sometimes they were even clergy, but what they did was rehashed existing stuff. They had very little contact with patients at all, but they were considered professionals. Surgeons were the next role. They were considered skilled craftsmen. They were literate. They'd had in some cases some textbook training, but their big thing was hands-on experience, unlike the physicians. And again, we'll see why that matters shortly. These are the kinds of things that they tended to do. Phlebotomy, pottery, bone setting. They were semi-professionals. Then we have the barber surgeon. Your average barber surgeon was mostly illiterate. They only got their training from some sort of apprenticeship, no schooling, no anything else. They did things like cupping, they would apply a pulstice, they might learn simple fracture setting, and they might do a few other things as directed by a physician, like the phlebotomy and the cautery. Um, and they often on the side to supplement their income, they did shaving and cutting of hair. And if you think about the barber poles we have seen today with the red and white stripes, well, rumor has it that those came from the barber would take their very uh, blood soaked rag and they would put it out and it's red and white and that's where the colors come from. <laughs> 
Then we have the apothecaries. Now they're an interesting bunch because if you think about pharmacists today, which is essentially what they were, your pharmacist doesn't do any prescribing. They just give you the medication your doctor prescribes. But in these days, they were the prescribers. However, they didn't have any understanding of the human body or disease. They might have had some herbalist training, but that's it. They prescribed stuff, drugs and treatments. This is all they knew. Uh, quick question. And our last group. Yep. Um, can you tell us what a poultice is? In, so you said um, the barbers used, uh, they yep. applied poultice. What is that? So it could be anything from crushed herbs to uh, different kinds of slathers and creams that they might put in a little pocket and they would place that on a portion of the body to make it feel better or whatever it is they're trying to fix. And we'll talk about more about the fixing in a few minutes um, when we get to, to uh, the treatments. So, the, but this is, these were essentially the roles. Other questions before I go on? Uh, nothing else coming through yet. Okay. So our last group of these non-professionals, and our non-professionals are exactly what they sound like. They've had no formal training. They, there's no formal organization or regulation or anything. These are a bunch of folks who essentially learn by trial and error. So maybe somebody in your little village, because these were usually folks in rural areas, got really good at knowing this herb helps this thing or this treatment really effective for that thing. And they tried it and it worked. So that's the person you went to in your rural area. They were great because they were cheap. They were very inexpensive, but that was really their biggest draw. They didn't necessarily know anything. Uh, the, the advantage was that they'd had some hands-on experience, whereas we saw the, 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 the physicians, like they don't have any hands-on or almost no hands-on. That's not really what they do. All right. So now that we know about who the folks were and what their roles were within this, let's talk about the theory of humors. And this theory is quite old. And this is what a lot of trying to fix people essentially comes down to. So the four humors, as you can see, are blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. And they are associated with some organs. You can see blood and heart, phlegm and brain, yellow bile and liver, black bile and spleen. But not only are they affiliated with those particular organs, they're also affiliated with temperatures and effectively like points, right? So hot and moist, like the air, the, the phlegm, was affiliated with the brain, which was in theory supposed to be cold and moist like water, your yellow bile liver, hot and dry like fire, and this black bile, your spleen was cold and dry like earth. So you can see in the little image in the corner there, this is, this idea is how they thought humans worked. And the physician's job, when you called them and you said, this is, something's wrong with me, was that they had to restore balance. Something was unbalanced. So there was too much of one and not enough of another. So the very first thing they would recommend is rest. You don't feel well, you should rest. And if that didn't work to ultimately restore balance, then they'd recommend things like diet changes or bloodletting, phlebotomy, cautery, and cupping. The diet change might be something like if you were hot and dry, if, the, if that, you know, they would tell, eat things that are now cold and moist to try to even that out. So that, that would be a, a, a cure, if you will. That would be a recommendation from the physicians. So most of medicine bases what it recommends on this notion of the theory of humors. So not only do we have these groupings of individuals who don't really know anything about the human body, but they also are making assumptions about how to make it healthy based on this ancient information. So what did they think caused the Black Death? Well, the number one thing was God's wrath. We did bad things, God is punishing us. And there were a number of different examples of why they thought it was God's wrath. It must be God and we're bad and therefore God is punishing us. Uh, and I, you know, I'm not gonna to get into the, the political side of things, but we did see certain groups that were made scapegoats and this was a pretty terrible thing as a result. 
Uh, but we also see another cause, and, and there were documents that were written that explain all of this. You can, you can read the treatises, these what they called medical treatises that explained all of this, that it was astronomy or astrology. That's the cause, right? Not only is God upset, but these planets are, are in conjunction. And again, this sort of re refers back to the whole humors thing. So Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars, if they're a conjunction, that's a problem because Jupiter is warm and hu humid and Mars is hot and dry and that combination is conflicting. And Saturn, by the way, it's just bad. Like there's no real description of why Saturn being in that grouping is problematic. It's just bad. They also thought it could be maybe environmental. So not only are the planets in being in conjunction a problem, but also, you know, climate change issues and earthquakes, uh, colors of the evening sky, heavy rains, all of these kinds of things were signs that this was an environmental problem. So those were what they thought the cause of the Black Death was. Now, how did they think it was transmitted? Here's where we get some thoughts that aren't super far away from what we, it turns out, was related. But the original thought was something called miasmas or corrupt air. And again, look at the time frame here. This comes from the second century, right? So what, what causes it? Well, the transmission of plague, it's this disease substance that comes in from the outside. It's carried by corrupt air and that's how it gets, you know, transferred from person to person. In 1348, we have Alfonso de Cor Cordoba who comes up with this poison theory, which this da Felino is the first to suggest poison as a natural cause, uh, but his description is a little more like the miasmas. Alfonso is the first one who starts, to, he, he's, Felino is the first one to suggest poison more generally. Alfonso says through the environment, like, you know, the corrupt air, um, but it could also be human agency. So he ingests water, food, or air. And so he makes recommendations about not drinking water from certain places or being careful about where your food comes from. So this is how they thought it was transmitted, at least in those, uh, in those literate spaces. And so here I'm are just looking at the, yes. the, the date says 1348 and the plague yep. dates we're looking at are 1346. So, yep. so they're still is... trying, there's, it's going and they're trying to figure it out. Uh, Di Felino is in Italy and Cordoba is in France uh, and they're writing about the same time. So, um, the, you know, everybody's trying to figure this out because it's obviously terrible and nobody's really getting it right. Uh, and then they tried to, you know, come up with treatments based on what they thought was, was causing it or the transmission. So, you know, why do bloodletting? Well, number one, that's because that's one of the things they'd always done. And so we need to get the humors back in alignment. We're going to do some bloodletting by the veins closest to the organ where a bubo would appear, which probably isn't a great idea because now you're not letting that lymphatic system do its job, right? We could just lance those bubos and put this Armenian clay ointment. That's going to solve everything. You saw occasionally these pharmaceuticals prescribed, but usually those are more preventative. So you get them to, you know, ideally not catch plague. And we saw that with the pharmacy folks, um, you know, they're herbalists. So we'll see why, again, why herbs and good smells, if you think about um, this whole idea that that the air is bad, right? They thought that smells, bad smells were part of this air being bad and the whole miasma thing. So if, if you could keep the air smelling good around you, that could somehow ward off the plague. Obviously bed rest and include, you know, increasing your fluids, this can't hurt. And then these salves and ointments and, you know, that sort of thing. So how did the plague become a turning point in history? Well, we saw that really there was very little science involved in this. We saw physicians who are guided directly by the church. A lot of their teaching comes from the church as we saw some of them are even clergy. And pretty much no matter what anybody prescribed or recommended, it didn't do any good. And they didn't really understand what was going on. It becomes a turning point because a number of things happen. First of all, 50% of the population died 
And that's a huge number. And that number, the more we've learned in the 20th and 21st century about the Black Death slash plague, the higher this number has grown. Uh, the original estimates were like maybe 30 to 40%, and now we know it was at least 50%. Lots of properties get abandoned. You know, you heard people ran away. But one of the major things that happened, because so many people died and we had so many properties that were now just there, the price of food and rent drops significantly because there aren't that many people now, right? We had an overcrowding problem. Now we don't. We have plenty of places to live, so no one's willing to pay a whole lot. We went from having very difficult time getting work, uh, or I'm sorry, a very difficult time uh, with there being so many people that workers were a dime a dozen to now there aren't that many people. Now workers are scarce. So you want to hire somebody, you're going to pay them more. And as a result, their standard of living starts to increase substantially. And this is mostly that the, you know, the peasant, the lower class folks. And we really see a blooming of this middle class, this new bourgeoisie that comes to pass. Some other significant changes. Not only is there less labor, but now we have to find a more efficient way to, to do production. So some places purchase better equipment, they reorganize things, they had to find better ways to do stuff because they're just not going to get the bodies to do the work they had before. And so living standards of the masses, are they improve because now they're being paid more, they're living better. Incomes for the upper class did drop because now they have to pay all these other people more and their way of life is somewhat jeopardized. So originally we had this huge dichotomy between the really rich and the really poor and now that's starting to come together. And there was this sense of Epicurean lifestyle, so this idea of pursuit of pleasure. And the reason why we see this is because people felt that this, none of this was long-term. Like this was great. There are now fewer people, there's more food, wages are better, but this isn't gonna last. So we have to eat all the things now, we have to drink all the things now, it's gonna revert, so we better be careful. So Epicurean lifestyle in this particular case meant a switch from really inexpensive grain-based, bean-based foods to meat, butter, beer, and wine, things that in the past really only your upper classes were going to be able to afford. They spent more time in taverns and inns. They bought fancy clothes and shoes and jewelry and bedding and household things and gizmos that we certainly see even today more of in the middle class. And interestingly enough, their sense of time changed. So previously, there were essentially two thoughts about time. One was the church notion of time. The church saw time as infinite because if you were a Christian, you were ultimately going to live forever. You were going to come back. You were going to be reborn. And merchants saw time as finite, re related more to money and distance in terms of their products. But with everything that happened, people started to consider the fact that maybe time wasn't so infinite. Merchants ultimately extended their hours and night work became common. Even some places required libraries to have clocks and that merchant time becomes the rule. So people start paying attention more to time. So how does all of this impact medicine? The church failed. That was who they relied on for medicine, because as we saw, the folks who had the most training, that's where most of them got it. But they didn't provide solace and support, and all of their advice was useless. And the people who were not part of the church, they were never consulted. They, they didn't write treatises. Nobody cared about you know, what they had to say. But not only did the church not provide any of these things, but the one thing that the church had always really been known for was spiritual comfort. And guess what? They didn't provide that either. Your parish police, priests, they fled like everybody else. I already told you the church is closed, right? So there was nobody to provide services or last rites. And 
I, in some of the other research that I've done, there's some interesting documentation that shows that even the liturgy itself, because of the fact that your priests fled and you didn't have official church people to do things like last rites and funerals, lay folks started to try to take on some of those responsibility. And there, there are, um, there's an entire book that talks about some of this literature and how it changed. They actually would take chunks out that were only written specifically for a priest and they made it more for lay people. And uh, so you had something that a lay person who was left in this town could still provide some form of last rites. But the, the churches, they were not there for people. So as a result, told you 50% of the population died. Well, a good chunk of that were people who were considered leading thinkers and practitioners. They're gone, they're dead. So now we can't get their advice anyway. And so we start to see the rise of surgery and surgeons. Remember I mentioned that those folks, they're the hands-on folks, right? They're learning from empirical data from what they're seeing, which is amazing because they're actually getting to understand what the human body is all about. They're starting to do things like autopsies, which is why I put that picture in the bottom right, because that was not something that your physician was ever going to have done in the past. They were too busy arguing what happened in Rome and Italy you know, a zillion years ago. So this is huge. And you had more people who, you know, they were interested in, in understanding how the body worked as well. Well, most people couldn't necessarily read Latin. So we start to see this bloom of vernacular medical texts. So now more and more people who are becoming literate, as you have this bourgeoisie starting to have the time to read and, and learn those things, now they can read it in a language that they understand. So, you know, I think Gabrielle and, Elle and I were joking about, you know, WebMD of its time, right? You, you couldn't, you can't Google it, but they had texts. The new role of hospitals. Uh, this fascinated me. So whenever I think of a hospital, I think of a contemporary hospital, you go to a hospital to get healthy, right? There's something wrong with you, you're sick, you have a broken appendage and you go to a hospital to get help. That is not what a hospital was in the Middle Ages. A hospital in Middle Ages Europe, it's a place that you segregated sick people to so that they wouldn't infect non-sick people. And that's, and you had, you know, in some cases you had leper communities that lived in hospitals, but the whole idea was get them away. Well, as all of these changes in medicine are happening, hospitals start to take on this new role and they start to develop wards. So they might have a ward for people with just a, with broken limbs, as opposed to somebody who's coughing something up. So they start to segregate their populations and they start understanding more about why that's important. You see all kinds of advances in public health and sanitation. You see the boards of public health start to be created and all the statistical type collections that we see today, that all starts because of these changes in medicine as a result of the plague. So I promised you beak masks. So we'll talk about the plague doctor. Uh, that was a, a type of quote unquote doctor. They weren't professionals. So they, they were not that first category we discussed. They were usually folks that um, couldn't cut it, let's say, uh, in any more professional <laughs> side than, than, you know, um, than sort of what their limited means would allow. They had special privileges. They could do autopsies. So again, this is kind of the beginning. They were paid a ton of money because no one wanted this job. They had no interaction with the public. It was just with the, the people that, you know, either had the plague or died from the plague. And this costume, which we often associate with the Black Death, didn't come along until 1619. And it is the PPE of its time. So, um, you know, instead of wearing your N95 respirator mask, you had this beak nose. It was effectively a respirator and you put fragrant items in it to keep those bad smells away. It had wax leggings, gloves, and boots. So again, you could keep your distance ideally from that person who was sick and it had a cane because if somebody came near you, you literally could poke them and keep them away. So that, that is your plague doctor. And so you can see the costume itself doesn't come along until much, much later. Uh, but the position did exist during this early period of time. <clears throat> 
All right, so now that we've kind of covered all of the historical stuff, what does this have to do with COVID-19? Like, what can we learn from all of this? Well, there's some commonalities and some differences. So we'll talk first about the commonalities and we'll talk about some differences. One of the things we know is that they're both zoonotic in nature. In other words, they both started with some sort of animal. Even though we know one is as we said, a virus, and the other one is a bacterial infection, they both start with an animal, and yet they still spread to people. We see that the incubation period in both of these things allows for the walking infected. So if folks are walking around, they don't know they're sick, and they may or may not be entirely asymptomatic in both cases, but they could be because we saw that period of time. Some of those early symptoms, boy, they're an awful lot like flu, right? And in both cases, what we thought was the major vector of spread for COVID and what we thought, what they thought the major uh, vector of spread was for the plague, they were, we were both wrong. And in both cases, quarantine was used to address. And that term derives from an Italian word that means 40 days. And the 40 day period was how long a ship had to stay essentially off port in the water waiting before folks could come on land in case, you know, to prevent the sickness from coming with them because they did start to figure out that it was being spread by people coming from one place and running to another. All right, some significant differences. We've already talked about the different kind of infection. Density, we've seen for COVID-19 is a serious problem. The more dense the population, the more problematic it is for COVID. Strangely enough, this is not the case for the Black Death. You would think it might be, but think about the human ratio, the ratio between humans and rats, depending on where you are. In an urban environment, the ratio of humans, of humans to rats and fleas is lower than in a rural area. So more people there are more people to share between fleas released from dead rats, right? If you have a lot of people, like in an urban setting, as the rats die, there's more people for them to hop onto. But in a rural setting, you don't have that. You have fewer people. So as the rats die, they hop to all the humans. So we actually saw that it was, that spread was worse and faster in these rural communities than you saw in the cities. You also saw that in some cases, so it was very common for the wealthy to be able to avoid some of these uh, illnesses that happened back then. This was not one of them, but it might take a little longer for them, them to get infected than it might for, uh, you know, the, the folks who were living much closer to the street, we'll say. Another important difference is that because Black Death is a bacterial infection. That infection does not die when the body is dead. And therefore, your dead body is contagious and it's really dangerous. However, with COVID-19, it's a virus. When the body dies, ultimately, so do the cells that the virus can infect and dead bodies are perfectly safe. I will leave you, and obviously we'll, we'll have a few minutes for questions as well, but I will leave you with a positive thought about all of this. It took us over 600 years to really understand the Black Death because it wasn't, re it wasn't until research started to be done in the 1900s that they really started to piece all of this together. And the flea thing was even more recent. So it took a really long time to understand that disease. But in six months, we've gone from there's this virus we don't know a whole lot about to advance knowledge. And yes, we still have a lot more to learn, but I would leave you with, I'd rather have six months than 600 years any day. And with that, very much other questions. Uh, so we have one question. Um, when the shift happened going from physicians to more of the surgeons, mm -hmm. uh, were did anti-vivisection laws continue on past that? Because that would have been something that the church had had prohibitions against. Did that continue through the 13th and 14th centuries? It did in some places and not in others. Um, 
it was still problematic for a long time. Uh, the later you got, the more it became commonplace. I mean, you already saw that plague doctors were allowed to start doing that because they were allowed to start researching. So even, even with that, you start to see it being more accepted, but there certainly were issues still. And it, it really varied based on the area. And I know too, um, there are still, so especially Rousseau wrote a lot about the moral agency and, and personhood of, of animals kind of, mm -hmm. um, but there there's a debate on whether or not animals feel pain. And so vivisection goes into that as well. Do you happen to know of any resources that someone might look into for the history of that? That I don't know offhand, but I know like I don't know specific resources, but I know there's a lot of information about the history of dissection. Um, one place you might look, and this is a little later, but it still might have some references. Uh, there is a woman named Lindsay Fitzharris who wrote about Victorian doctors. And um, she has a book that is like a couple years old and she talks some about this and about uh, students coming to see dissections. So um, I know that there's some historical information in there that might be useful. Great. Um, another question. Was there one or more primary causes that ended the epidemic or did it just kind of run its course or? My impression is that it, it ran its course um, and it spread all over and it killed off who it was going to kill off and and because the rat population dies off and you don't see that restart again you don't wind up with we'll call it a local plague focus so that was my impression i mean like i said it still exists in pockets we still see it all over the world including in this country but um and then ultimately we figured out hey if we give you some, you know, medication that can cure this, now we don't have this problem anymore. So I think, I mean, we, we see Yersinia pestis makes a reappearance later um, in waves in, in various areas. Uh, but I do think it sort of peters out each time until they figure out, hey, this medication thing is good stuff. Right. Uh Penicillin is an excellent treatment for yes. many things. Antibiotics um, are wonderful. Yes, and unlike the virus that we're really facing now, penicillin and antibiotics would be effective because the plague was a Correct. bacterial infection. Yeah. Exactly, yep, absolutely. And I'll just throw this up there. These are some resources uh, that I use to put this together, plus a couple of others um, that uh, I would just recommend if you want more information. The, the Black Death of Personal History is a work of fiction based greatly on factual information because there's not a lot of information about what sort of the everyday person would have experienced. So what this author did is he took documents from a particular town. He created a single character who is a, I believe he's a priest, uh, who did not exist. He's completely fiction. But all the other names and information in the book is all real. It's all facts based on this town. And he just threaded it together based on what we know um, to try to provide that picture. So I, I, I added that in, even though that's not directly um, part of this. And um, the other book, let's see, the other one that I added in here, um, Oh, the order of the good death. So if you've got questions about the stuff I talked about with the dead bodies and COVID-19, they've got a great article that, that talks about, uh, it's got an FAQ about that topic. So I threw that in here too. So even though that's not directly in detail, it, it is relevant. Excellent. Thank you so much. And we will include these references in our email when we great. send that out um, following the program. In that email, we also have a survey that we would like you to answer, but if you feel like clicking on a link now, you can answer the survey this evening. But this brings us to the end of our program. Thank you so much for joining us today. We thank you, Dr. Ullman, for sharing your expertise and your research.
Um, and really, it's great to have everyone here together. Um, it's always great to learn with you all. Next week, we will talk about how diversity boosts innovation. If you would like to sign up for that, there is a link in our web pages, but I will also drop that link in the chat. And I'll just click on that one as I thought. And if um, we didn't get if we didn't get to your burning questions, send them to Gabrielle. She'll make sure that I get them, and I will get back to you. Absolutely, yes. So tomorrow we'll send out the email with the, these resources that have been listed, and you can feel free to email me. My um, email is on the website, but you can also get me at g graham g g r a h a m at sciencebuff e u f f dot org. Um, and if you would like to visit us in person at the museum, you're welcome to come in. We're open on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, and our special exhibit, Golden Mummies of Egypt, is extended through October 18th. So if you want to talk about blinging out your dead, that is a great opportunity. You can sign up on our website for um, an, uh, a time to come in. So thank you all very much. I'm going to end the recording now. So now we're not being recording, but uh, the program's officially over. You all are welcome to hang out or to leave. If you have additional questions, you can always email us. Um, this has been a, a delight. I loved hearing about Thank you so and, much for, mm -hmm. for having me. It's, it's been a lot of fun. And I um, particularly like the fact that you're an independent researcher because this is helpful for people to know that just because you don't get paid to do something doesn't mean that you can't do something. And um, in, in my own background in the history of natural history, most people up until the 1800s didn't get paid for anything that they did. So if you want to be a good scientist or researcher, you just do it yourself. And hopefully you also get to eat. So it's important. Starving scientists. Yeah, pretty common.